Hello, Cinnabar Moss, or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome to the Writer's Triangle, Cinnabar Moss podcast about all things publishing and books. Today we are here with Alec. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm okay. I got a bit of an earache, but other than that, I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad you hear that you're doing well. I'm sorry about the earache. Hopefully that passes by quickly. Uh-huh. Uh, so you are part of Pulp Modern. You are the owner of Pulp Modern. And looking over your website and your submission guidelines, it states absolutely no subject is taboo. What made you decide to take that approach to welcome all stories? Well, I'm a writer first, like most people in indie publishing. Um, I'm I'm in indie publishing because I want to write things that might be distasteful to the mainstream. And that's fine. That's not a complaint on my part. Uh, that's just the way things are. And I, I put that... I put that in the guidelines because I frequently see in a lot of literary, whether it's pulp or literary fiction, uh, in their guidelines, they say, uh, you know, no violence against women, uh, no racism, no hurting animals, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like, well, you know, what if, what if you want to like, let's say, what if uh, Nabokov was submitting Lolita to a publisher today and they had those guidelines? Uh, we would be deprived of Lolita. Right. So I think that that's, that's like a controversial aspect of Pulp Modern that's gotten us into trouble with uh, you know, people who think they're gatekeepers in publishing. And I think they don't understand, or, at least, or maybe they don't want to understand. Um, if somebody sends me a story that is blatantly glorifying, let's say, violence against animals. I'm not going to publish it, of course. Yeah. What, what I'm saying to writers is express what needs to be expressed. If, if we can't explore dangerous topics in fiction, how are we going to deal with these problems in the real world? Mm. So, so that's, that's all that really means. What, what I, I just don't, I see so many of these these stipulations, uh, for lack of a better word, in in various guidelines, and I just want to say, you know, send the story over. If, if it's distasteful to me, it won't get in the magazine. It's, it's that simple, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So that's all it is. I really I really want to make it clear at at Pulp Modern, uh, we want to see fiction from everybody. I want to hear all the voices that we have not heard because because of the traditional gatekeepers in publishing. I want to hear those voices at Pulp Modern and my my publishing imprint, Uncle B Publications. I am looking for uh, to publish books by writers that, you know, like when you're writing about the streets in America, uh, the mainstream cannot deal with the truth, but I can. So send it, send it over to me. And so your goal in all of this is instead of being a gatekeeper, you want to be someone who's opening the gates to allow these types of topics to be broached and to be talked about and enter into the discourse rather than hiding it away as if it's something shameful. In a, well, in, a, in an intelligent and thoughtful way. Of you course. know, I... I get, I'll tell you, I get, um, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but when I, Pulp Modern's been around for 10 years now, and in the beginning, I would always get about three or four stories by guys who obviously haven't gotten over their personal quarrels with women, mm -hmm. and uh, they write about awful, horrible things happening to women, and it's they do it in such a way it's obvious that they're getting some kind of thrill out of it. And I, I didn't want to write back and lecture them. Uh, we're all adults. You know, I didn't want to say, you know, this nobody's going to want to read this. You know, go, go see a psychologist, figure out <laughs> what it is you're having issues with. And, you know, because it'll make you a better writer if you can get over that. If you got these, these stupid vendettas, um, which is what these guys are doing. You know, so I just, I, I would uh, reject the story, and that would be that. Um, you know, I that's not, 
that's not approaching anything in a thoughtful way, what they're doing. Yeah. You know, we, we, good, really good fiction makes us have conversations and hopefully advances the species in a, uh, in a spiritual way, you know, and by spiritual, I don't mean any kind of religion. I just mean makes us better people overall. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that concept of using fiction as a means to talk about and broach subjects and open a thoughtful discourse that allows people to break into break uh, away from the kind of very restricted don't talk about anything uh, system that's kind of happening in the modern day about a lot of different topics and that avoidance of conversation often leads to unhealthier thoughts going unchallenged and also some healthier concepts not being approached or even necessarily discovered because people aren't getting the opportunity to talk about it and so i think it's wonderful that you're providing that opportunity and you mentioned that you have a, a press where you're publishing books as well so that you that transfers into the next question of you have a digest as well as offering print uh, along with the e-copies and you're doing a great job with both doing, but it's still quite a bit of work Where's the inspiration and motivation to come from to do both sides? Well, that's an excellent question because I, I can't really answer that. This has been a labor of love for, like I said, 10 years now. I, I, start, I got into the indie scene um, or a particular part of the scene. There's, there's no one scene. We should make that clear. Hmm. There's lots of different writing communities and whatnot, but the... The basic one, the crime fiction one that I sort of became known in, um, I, I got into that around 07 or 08, and then I started All Due Respect in 2010, and then quickly handed that off to Chris Radigan to take care of when I started Pulp Modern. And I learned very quickly that um, there's no, at least at the time, there was no profit in it. And I... I just kept, I don't know why I kept doing it. Uh, people, every time I said I'm going to stop, people would write me and say, you can't stop. We don't have anywhere to send our stories. <laughs> so I think as a writer, I just, I understand that need for markets. Yeah. And the the indie scene went through a very dark period in the uh, mid part of the last decade. So Thuglet, I'm sure you're familiar with Thuglet, uh, they... They, they stopped publishing around, I think, 16, hmm. 2016. And all the, almost all the, the journals and presses that were around when I first came into the scene, almost all of them were gone. There was nowhere to send stories uh, except for Pulp Modern. For, I think we kept it alive for about two years, two crucial years. Hmm. And... Um, I, I was ready to quit after what, what's now known as Volume 1, Issue 10. And I did quit for about a year. And then I, I asked Richard Krauss, who uh, he runs a thing, uh, a digest called the, the Digest Enthusiast. And he had interviewed me in one of his magazines. And I was looking at the magazine and I thought, my God, this, this guy is brilliant. Let me see if he'll be willing to come on and do... Uh, work on Pulp Modern with me so that I can focus on other things and he can just put it together and make a consistent looking journal from issue to issue. Yeah. And uh, the, I think the results are great. I'm, I'm very, I boast a lot about Pulp Modern because I have very little to do with it. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I know some, you know, we'll probably talk about this, but it really has to do with the, the writers and the art director and the illustrators they make it a great product. My job is insanely easy now. It's always nice having a reliable team that can bring things together in a very beautiful and cohesive way. Mm -hmm. and, and so you've reached out to uh, other people and brought them in on to the project Pulp Modern and you've taken a very collaborative approach similar to how we have or I guess we're similar to you because you predate us <laughs> when it comes to taking collaborative approach for publishing. And we're lucky that you're one of the, uh, that we're one of the publishing houses that you're collaborating with. 
And all I know, was it easy for you to take this collaborative approach in an industry that tends to have these kind of gatekeeping personalities and this kind of more cut approach at times? Yeah, again, it's an interesting question. I have not felt that there was any cutthroat activity until recently. Um, people came after Pulp Modern and tried to basically what we sometimes say cancel it. Mm. And they did so on entirely you know, uh, false grounds. They said it's some sort of, it accused us of misogyny. Um, which if you've read any, you know, and I, I told them, I said, show me, show me where it is. Show me the misogyny. Of course they couldn't, but it doesn't matter today. Um, you know, all you have to do on social media is make the accusation. It's like Salem. You just say, oh, you know, like if you catch your neighbor sleeping with your wife, you go to the, the tribunal and you say, ah, oh, my, my neighbor, my wife, I think they're witches. And that's that. Yeah. Uh, there doesn't have to be any nuanced discussion or anything. And the reason that they did it is they want, in the old days, like let's say, let's talk about um, with musicians, like blues musicians. If uh, there's a great guitar player in your town and you think you're a better guitar player, you go and you, you cut heads, right? You, you, you get up on stage and you see who's the better guitar player. But uh, that's not what's happening today. What they want to do is they just want to slander and libel your publication and move it out of the way that way. Mm. So, so they don't have to do the work, the real work that's necessary to be a, a true competitor. I, I never, initially I never thought of any other magazine as a competitor. Thuglet was Thuglet. It was its own thing. Yeah. Um, needle was Needle. It was its own thing. Uh, the, the great beat to a pulp, that was its own thing. Uh, but I guess, I guess there's a new, a new batch of, writers who, who think that uh, they really need to, to just get rid of competition. And it could, it could be naive. You know, I could be naive. It, this could be, could have been what's go been going on the whole time. And I just didn't see it. I, it just got so graphic over the last uh, year and a half mm. that, uh, that I finally noticed it. But uh, I don't know what I, I, I've rambled here a little bit. What, what was the original question? I was just, was it, is it easy taking a collaborative approach in an industry that can uh -oh. be a little bit cutthroat at times or yeah. quite a bit sometimes? Yeah. Well, let me, yeah, let me do you the favor and actually answer your question. Um, <laughs> I would say that, um, the, the cutthroat stuff aside, uh, collaborative working together with, with people who have a, a like mind, and that doesn't mean you think the same. It just means we kind of, we see the same destination. Yeah. Um, I can't think why you wouldn't do that. Uh, since I asked Richard Krauss to be the art director, the the difference between volume one and volume two of Pulp Modern, uh, it's like, and, and the writers in volume one were great. It's not the story. It's not the quality of the stories. But I was doing everything, and I'm not a professional graphic artist. Mm. And so those issues look like they were put together by a high school staff. Nothing wrong with, uh, nothing against high school staffers, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah, yeah. very amateurs. Now uh, with Richard Krauss and with, with illustrators and everything, uh, we have a product that looks as good and I think better than uh, the pulp journals that are on the newsstands. Mm. And that's because of collaboration. You know, I'm a, I'm a former, I very briefly, I played uh, minor league football when I was in my twenties and I learned there cause I'm, I'm a, traditionally I'm a, an individualist. I really believe in the power of the individual. But uh, when I played football, I kind of learned, oh, you know, there, there are times in life where you do need a team to accomplish something. Yeah. And I think that in publishing, that's true. I think the, the more people you have working and that you're collaborating with, um, as long as you're all, as long as y'all get along and everything, uh, you're, you're you're bound to create something much better than any of you could uh, as individuals. Yeah, we definitely agree with it. Uh, at Center Mouth, we agree with your philosophy that the individual can do a lot, and the individual is very powerful. But many individuals coming together for a like goal and working towards that creates something more beautiful than just one person could 
truly really manage themselves. And that requires building a team that works well and, and fits well together and requires quite a bit of planning and organization. And so we at Center of Moth, we took about six years of planning uh, to plan it out and to build our team. How long did it take for you to fully conceptualize Pulp Modern from start of the concept to creation? Uh, well, I, I would say, if I were being fully honest, I would say set, six years. Because I, you know, I had the idea right away, and I just, I, I'm the kind of person I just launch into it. I'm ready, you know, as soon as I have the idea, I'm ready to go, which is not always a good thing. And so we had that volume one where, if you look at every issue, is an experiment, hmm. and it, it took, it really took me to say, you know what, I, I need help on this to create uh, a consistently good journal. So. Yeah, I would say six six years. That's about the same uh, that you guys said. Six years is a, perhaps a magic number. A magic <laughs> number. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, do you have any new issues coming out that you could tell us about what we can expect with Pulp Modern? You mentioned that it initially was a bit more experimental and has become more consistent and has evolved in a lot of ways. And so, what's coming down the the pipe that you might like or be able to share with us? Well, the, the issue that is due any day now is the 10th anniversary issue. And so I asked, uh, I, I normally don't do a theme anymore. There was a period where I did a theme during volume one. That was one of the many experiments. Mm -hmm. But for the 10th anniversary, I said, let's go back to the year 2011. Because I, I'm sure you know, like, it was radically different. The world was <laughs> radically different in 2011, which is hard to believe. Yeah, it's uh, still so recent. Right. It's only it's technically it's only 10 years ago, and if I think between 2011 and 2001, it doesn't seem like that much of a change. But um, of course, we've we've just had so many bizarre things going on in the last 10 years. Uh, COVID itself, you know, it feels like. If you think about 2019, that feels like that was 10 years ago. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. So, so I told the writers that you know 2011 should have something to do with your stories, and uh, so we have we have a nice mix uh, of stories that, in one way or another, are related to something that happened in 2011. I think a couple of writers just threw some 2011 stuff in there, which is fine. You know, if the ultimately if the if the story is good, I'm not going to turn it away. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, and we have um, uh, Edward Granger. That's the writing uh, one of the the names that David Cranmer writes under. And David Cranmer is the founder of Beat to a Pulp. He's kind of like my mentor in this whole thing. Like he's who I spoke with back in 2010 and 2011 when I was putting all these things together. And he had a he has a character called Cash Laramie, who's a it's an old Western uh, marshal. And he had a story in the first the very first issue of Pulp Modern in 2011. So we, we brought him back for a another Cash Laramie story in in this upcoming issue. And uh, it's exciting. Uh, yeah, Anthony Percante he started doing nonfiction articles for us, and uh, he has an article about. Uh, Walter Mosley in in this issue, and uh, we, I, you know, I always discover. I, I don't like. I'm not. I'm not discovering them like uh, discovering a star or anything. But I'm always learning about new writers in this in this job. And every issue, there's one or two writers that I was previously unfamiliar with. And this time around, uh, one of those writers is a woman named Karen Harrington, who. Uh, she accomplishes with her writing one of my personal, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, the things I want to see in a good story. She writes really good, clean prose. Uh, um, not not like free of profanity, but but like the prose itself is just very well crafted. Mm -hmm. So your 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 eye just it. Uh, I always compare it to like uh, slicing through. Uh, warm butter with a knife, you know, it just your eye just goes right through that prose and uh, She's a really good writer and she kicks off 
the the issue. So, and then I'm looking forward to that. And of course, Rand Scott is our illustrator, and as usual, he's he's coming up with. Uh, I I think like uh, you know the ma- magazine Heavy Metal. I I think this guy should be drawing for Heavy Metal. <laughs> uh, he's he's just that good. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, uh, this is kind of a secret, but it, it doesn't need to be a secret. I actually, and I never told Rand this, but I sent a letter of recommendation to Heavy Metal on his behalf. I, I just I sent oh, them a letter. I said, you got to hire this guy. And I, I hope it doesn't get him in trouble because, you know, some people will they'll take offense to that. They'll be like, ah, oh, nobody tells us who to hire. But uh, hmm. he's such a good illustrator. I just thought I, I got to help this guy get, uh, you know, bigger and better work. So, so that's that's what we got to look forward to. And then uh, later this year, we have an issue because we're celebrating the tenth anniversary. A uh, year that, for some reason, is very meaningful to me is 1981. Uh-huh. And so we just got those stories in the the 1981 theme stories. Um, and so that I haven't I haven't even started going through those yet, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. So that's that's what's on the horizon, and and I and I'll really I'll I'll just I'll kind of reveal here uh, by in 2022, we are going to do some different things with Pulp Modern because it's it's just time to, you know, mix it up a little bit. So it's it's going to be a little bit different in the future. Okay, so that's that'll be ex- an exciting thing for everybody who's been following Pulp Modern to see what mm-hmm. new things come out, and for new followers of Pulp Modern to experience this. Uh, change and this evolution into yep. an, a new pulp modern again and hopefully you things will continue to evolve in a way that people are able to connect with and they've connected so far and i'm sure they will continue to do so <laughs> i hope so <laughs> and you mentioned going back to talking about the stories that you really enjoy clean prose for mm-hmm. writing and that's one of the things that you look for in a story. What are some other things that make up the perfect pulp modern story, if you could describe one? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. I'm, I'm a very fickle reader. I do like clean, clean prose is one of the best ways to get my attention. And one of, you know, just to, to clarify a little bit, one thing, one of the marks of clean prose is we don't see a lot of needless repetition of words and phrases that tells me that the writer has really done their revision work. Mm. Um, that's, that's a really technical thing. I'll tell you that the two, two things that are really important to get a story on my radar. One is, uh, you absolutely have to get to the plot quickly because we are, we are dealing with short stories with pulp fiction and I get a lot of stories where the writer uh, sets up, sets the stage for about 10 pages. Well, in, in a 5,000 word story, you know, that's a 5,000 words, double space is about 20 pages. Mm. So you've used half your story for the setup. That means, that means the things that really need to be attended to, which is the, uh, uh, the resolution of the conflict, which is what the uh, story is really about. Yeah. Um, you only have half the story to do that. And so I try, I really try to encourage, uh, writers to, if you have back story information, stuff that, that we need to know, uh, you can, you can bring that in later. It's called backfilling, you know, uh, if the story should start as close to the conflict as possible. Mm-hmm. In fact, I, a, a story that tells me the conflict the first sentence i'm always i'm riveted right there i'm like this writer really knows what they're doing now i'm sure there are people that will argue with me on that literary writers i'm sure are horrified to hear that (laughs) which is fine literary i think i think of literary fiction as a genre and it's a different kind of genre oh yeah um it's it's a genre where you you have a lot more freedom in terms of how you tell the story we don't have that in pulp fiction we we are we are telling the story of the the old cave painting of the you know the the caveman hunting the uh, the the mammoth right yeah like we got to get right to it we don't want to know what the caveman had for breakfast <laughs> we don't need to know that uh, whereas literary fiction might tell you that like that might be more important to literary fiction that's 
I'm getting a little bit uh, off base here, but uh, that's 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 one thing that uh, you know if, if your story is just struggling to get to the conflict, you're going to be in trouble with me as as an editor. The other thing is uh, you hear all the time there are no new ideas. Uh, in terms of story structure, that might be true because I've I've really I'm someone that's really tried to experiment with story structure, and it seems like the harder I try to veer away from story structure the more stubborn and persistent story structure is to <laughs> sneak into the story. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's weird. Our brains are just, they're wired for a certain kind of story structure. But uh, you can have new ideas. You can have new concepts. And so some, it's just something a little bit original uh, is, is going to be necessary. Um, okay. And... You know, when, when we talk about uh, traditionally unheard voices, uh, those writers have a bit of an advantage if they're sending it to me, because the chances are they can bring in something I'm not familiar with, and I'll just I'll think, oh, this is unique. That will really help them. Mm -hmm. um, so in the in the new issue of Pulp Modern, the one coming out, um, a writer named I think her name's Sarah Cavano. I hope I didn't mess that up. Uh, she has a kind of a monster story, and it's uh, from the point of view of a woman with her baby in an abandoned bus station. And just all those elements, just for me, they just came together and, and really held my attention. And then, of course, it's a monster story. I like monster stories. So okay. she had an original monster. Uh, so that that's it. I, I really, I, th there's no set formula at, at the end of the day. And the way that I read, I just read stories over and over again. I have a folder where I, I keep them. And then gradually, by the fourth or fifth time I've read them, I start to see which stories are really sticking with me and which ones are not really holding my attention. Okay. And that's how that's how the process of elimination starts. So your process for you is, isn't you just read it once, you know, you review the story, revisit it, and kind of see how your feelings for the story evolve over time. For the most part. Now, there's some stories, excuse me, I had to take a drink. There's some stories that um, I can tell right away it's not going to work. Mm. Uh, here's something I, I've seen in recent years. I don't know why this is happening. I'll get stories by writers who will try to write a character from another country who has an accent, who speaks English with an accent. They will try to write that accent. Mm. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in just letting the reader figure that out um, and letting the reader have the accent in their head. Like, if you tell me this guy's come from Spain, I already know as a reader he probably speaks with a little bit of an accent. Yeah. Uh, so you don't need to – it's really weird to me. And I see that. And, again, I don't want to lecture another adult what to do with their lives. I don't want to tell them what to do. So I just quietly reject it. I mean, that, mm. that's a really, some people might think that's, that's fickle or whatever, but I, no, it, I think that that's very reasonable is say, Hey, we don't need to be so ha kind of ham fisted about this. We can allow the reader to fill in some of the gaps here and just, we can just express it with a couple words and then let the reader figure out what that means to them in terms of how their mental voice of that character evolves and develops. Right. Well, and, and then, I mean, that's that's a lesser crime. I mean, there's, you know, writers, if, if, I, if I detect something that's, that's just blatantly offensive, because uh, you have, you know, unfortunately with this whole free speech thing, you have the issue appears to have been taken over by the right, and in some cases the far right. And um, they, a lot of them, I don't want to make any generalizations, but a lot of them feel like uh, battling on behalf of free speech means being intentionally offensive. Well, that's not, to me, that's not productive. Right. You're not accomplishing anything there other than, you, it's, it's, that's like the former guy, as everybody calls him now, uh, his tweets where it, he's clearly just trying to make people angry. Yeah. 
Um, I don't mind fiction that makes people angry if it makes them angry for a reason. But if the reason and is it, just to make people angry, that's not a reason. Right. Yeah, but there's no reason to do that. Uh, or, well, actually, I, somebody could argue with me on that. But me personally, I, I'm not interested in, in somebody shouting, you know, offensive stuff just just to get a rise out of somebody. Like, like why are you saying that? The um, It, it kind of goes back to... Uh, Kubrick, Stanley, I'm also a filmmaker, and, and Stanley Kubrick's my favorite director. And he said he said that uh, a successful film should have both form and function, and I believe that about all art. Hmm. So it's it's entertaining, but it also it's uh, it's having a conversation with the audience about life in some way. Right. Some people might call me pretentious, and that's fine, but. <laughs> Uh, but I really do. I, I just feel like um, if you're if you're just being offensive to be offensive, I don't think that uh, it's it's worth anybody's time. And mm. so if I if I detect that right away, that story is going to be uh, rejected. Of course, uh, really, you know, poor writing, uh, or if it's obvious that the uh, writer has not edited or revised their work. I will okay. notice that right away, and I mean I've gotten to the point where I can I can read the first three pages of a story, and I know whether or not this is something I need to consider. I think that's good yeah. having that experience, especially when you're getting uh, a lot of submissions, being able to sort through them quickly and kind of figure out okay, these are ones that I'm going to consider again, and I'll revisit. But these ones I'm good; they don't quite fit with my image and my uh, beliefs regarding how writing should function and i think that yeah. having your beliefs is com is good and helps to create a consistent uh profile for pulp modern that is quite successful as we've seen you've been around for a long time and survived through times that other places have shut down for a myriad of reasons and that success is born in part due to your standards and the work that you've put in to make sure that the stories fit in and are good. And so yeah, sure. I think that that looks and represents very well. And then following up on that, you mentioned that the length for the story is about 5,000 words on the long end. If I recall correctly, it's roughly 3,000 to 5,000 words is the length that you've chosen. And how do you decide on that length for the stories that you'd like to see? Well, I, I think that a short, if you're going to call something a short story, you really, you really don't want to go over 5,000 words. Uh, now, we, we know there are always exceptions. Uh, but once you go over 5,000 words, you're starting to wander into what I consider novelette territory. Hmm. That's, that's up to 10,000 words. And then, of course, after that, you're in novella territory, et cetera. Uh, we want, we want short stories. Um, and honestly, I, I find kind of a, a real sweet spot for a short story is about 3,500 words. Not because the thing about a short story is your, your basic, the, the skeleton of the story should be very simple. Hmm. You should have a very simple conflict and very, it should be a very simple situation. You should think in terms the way that a, like a low budget filmmaker thinks. They don't, they don't, think they're going to have lots of different locations and you know right. hundreds of different actors and whatnot it's usually it's like night of the living dead it's like six actors in a house <laughs> and and your short story should kind of be the same it should be you should uh, keep it simple it's uh i have a coin from uh alcoholics anonymous it says keep it simple and i as a writer i keep that over my desk to remind me you know uh it's the, the best way to to hold the reader's attention is to not bombard them with uh, too much. Like with fantasy and science fiction, you, you, we know there's world building and whatnot that goes on. So for a short story, you, you got to keep that simple. Mm. Uh, you know, give give us a little bit of the world, get us into that world with the conflict and resolve the conflict. Um, so I just that that just comes from experience. I I really think. Uh, about 3,500 words, 35 to 45, it's really the, the right amount. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But, you know, there's, there's always exceptions. Yeah, I think there's always going to be times when someone amazes you with something outside of what you would normally ex- uh, expect or think of as the ideal. And that's wonderful, right? We love to see people bring something new, and that amazes us. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's true. And I, I would just like to interject there. You were talking about beliefs about writing. And it, it's true, I do uh, stick to my beliefs about writing. But I, I don't want anyone, any writer listening to think that my beliefs in general cannot be challenged or questioned. Mm-hmm. I really welcome that. I love stories that force me to reconsider uh, my opinions or my beliefs. Even if it doesn't change my mind, I, I love the um, the effort. Yeah, I think that goes back to what you said earlier in the interview when you're talking about fiction should be in some form or at least have a discourse or a topic that is discussed or opens the discussion for it and that allows you, if the discussion comes from a different angle than what the angle that you come from, to be able to have that kind of consideration involved. Yeah, we, we really, the, our, I think our, our culture here, at least in the West, I don't know about the rest of the world, I think we've really lost sight of the fact that uh, everybody has a different life experience. Hmm. And we really need to, uh, bef- like uh, before you know, somebody says something that, that doesn't jibe with what you believe, we, we, we right away we jump to, ah, oh, it's offensive, or how dare you say that, or whatever, or you're, you're an idiot, blah, blah, blah. We need to stop and remember, we need to communicate some more and learn. Why, why does that other person think that way? You know, and usually you talk to somebody after a while, you'll realize, oh, they're, I see why they think that way. I don't agree with them, but I see why they think that way. Yeah. And there's always that room where you can be respectful to the other person's view while holding your own. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I wonder, you know, I, I really don't know what's happened. If it's social, you know, uh, the writer that I know named Andrew Miller said it's, it's social media. Social media has disrupted the way human beings communicate and not in a particularly good way. And I, I don't know what the, if that's true, but if it is, I don't know what the route back to or, or the route onward to a more enlightened way of communicating is. I think that things like this where we have discussions in a bit more of a long form can help people to see us and get a a deeper view into who we are. And for example, you being able to express your views on writing and fiction and have people kind of get a peek behind the curtain because it's really hard to get more than a a bite-sized sample of someone with just social media. And so I think things like this help, and I think, of course, having being open to these discussions and expressing openness helps to bring people into that who are willing to do it. And of course, there's always going to be people who aren't necessarily interested or may not have the emotional space or energy necessary to, to come to the discussions, but some people may even, despite that, read it and be able to enjoy the discussion from afar. And I think that having these opportunities is really, really wonderful. And part of that is due to social media's reach as well. So it kind of has a positive and a negative effect in, in different ways. And we just kind of work our way through it, is my take on it. Yeah, well, I, I, hope, that, I hope that happens. I hope, we, we, I hope social media itself evolves. Mm. And so moving on to the, the next uh, question for you is, you mentioned before that you have superb uh, graphics designers and workers who do amazing work for Pulp Modern, and we've loved the issues and the art in them, and do you have a list of artists that you're like, yes, these are the wonderful people, and I always rely on them, and I know I can always rely on them to do a great job, that you would like to perhaps talk about? Yeah, I've well, I've mentioned two of them a couple times already. Uh, Richard Krauss, Richard Krauss should be working in big time publishing. The fact that he's not, of course, is, is criminal. But uh, yeah, there, we know lots of people like that who do great work, and you know they they don't get the accolades that they should. Mm. Um, him, Rand Scott, our illustrator. Uh, we're working with a new illustrator uh, named I think Melo Guerna. I hope I didn't mess up his last name. He's Italian. 
Uh, he's a very good artist. Um, I have a, a web person that I work with uh, who is a genius. It's another person who should be making millions of dollars doing this and is not. Uh, you know, just to put it in, in I guess, capitalist terms, you know. <laughs> um, it's because it, it'd be nice, you know, if these, these great artists, these great people, uh, if they could quit their day jobs and do what they're clearly meant to do. Mm. You know, what they are clearly put on this earth to do. R Richard Krauss, like I said, I think this guy is a genius. What he does with independent publishing is, it's mind-boggling. I, you know, I, why isn't he, why isn't he designing Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine? It's, it, it baffles me. So, I definitely do have that, that list. <laughs> and uh yeah i you know to to anyone who's listening who is thinking well i'd like to start a, a a digest uh first of all you're always welcome to because writers always need places to send their work but yes they do uh really take to heart what we've been talking about with regards to collaboration and, and teams and all that uh don't try to do it by yourself it's it's much much more rewarding to work with a group of people we definitely agree, and we also have some artists that I'd like to give a quick shout out to. We we uh, hire uh, there's a site that we go to called Mibly where we hire artists for our books, cover artists. We mm -hmm. absolutely love the work of Ivan Zan, Nada Bakovich. I hope I didn't get that name uh, wrong, and Faye Constance, and all of them are wonderful artists that we've worked with, and we really enjoyed working with them. And part of the process that is most pleasurable for us in working with artists and working with authors is experiencing their creativity and also in some ways giving them the opportunity for their creativity to come out and be viewed by the world. What, what do you love most about the process with working with these creative and talented people? Uh, I, I just love that they, they have some place where they, they, their work can be displayed. I, I uh, would be remiss real quick if I didn't mention Tia Janae, who is designing uh, the majority of our book covers at Uncle B Publications. Mm -hmm. uh, she's another person that's a genius, just a genius. And uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I like I really like when, like I said, each issue, when I discover those one or two writers I, I haven't heard of before. And they're really good. Uh, it's exciting. I, I think uh, I, I'm sure since you've you've participated in this process, you know, like, oh, yes. you know, when you when you get ready to introduce other people to a writer that you know is good, it's exciting. It's uh, it's like it's just it's you know it's like the uh, I don't know how old you are, but when I was in high school, uh, I was in high school in the '80s, and mm. when you had to. In order to alternative music back then was really alternative. It meant it was not on the radio. You had to go to the record store, yeah, and and flip through the the records and look for the obscure bands. And you, you know, I would, I'm a even though I'm not good with graphic arts, I'm a big graphic arts person. So I would often get an album based on the cover, and every it, it's that that's real hit or miss. So when I would discover a band that was unbelievable i just couldn't wait to share it with with my friends at school you know it's it's that kind of feeling yeah i, I also feel a similar excitement um just so you know i'm i'm 27 so <laughs> <laughs> i was yeah, around for the 80s but mm -hmm. i do understand what you're talking about with the excitement of sharing the these people that you've discovered or this or the bands that you discovered in high school because i think about the authors that were that we are publishing currently and have plans to publish in the future. And it's just so amazing to be able to be like, the book's coming out. People are going to read this. We're bringing people the opportunity to read this story that we were excited and loved and enjoyed. And have that moment and that experience of also experiencing the author's excitement when their book is being published and their enthusiasm during the process. It's all very, very wonderful and inspiring. And I think it's probably one of the most rewarding aspects of the job. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let me let me interject here. Um, 
so us us older folks, uh, oftentimes we we tend to uh, chastise the younger generation for music and everything. And but the truth is, uh, not much has changed. And I, you probably know this. If you want to find a great band, you have to go looking for it. Yeah. Because even the 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 main most of the mainstream music in the '80s is kind of nonsense. Uh, that's always the case. The, 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 the mainstream people who produce music and books and movies and all that, they have a financial risk that we, that, you know, the independence that we don't have. And they, they can't take tremendous risks on something that might not sell millions of copies. And so I just, uh, cause you know, it, it seemed like I was bragging a little bit about going to the record store, but today, you know, you just... Yeah. You go on Reverb Nation or Bandcamp or something and search around, and you'll find that there's great music being made. You know, somebody in a garage in Kansas <laughs> right now is recording a, the, the greatest rock album ever. The same with indie publishing. You know, it's uh, it's it for people who want to experience something really different and new. You have to go the indie route. You have to. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's, again, it's not a slam on mainstream. I really wish I could write a mainstream book, but that's just not who I am. Hmm. And, and that's okay. It's okay. You know, uh, sometimes people think that's, that's whining or complaint. It's not whining or complaint. It's just, it's an objective fact. Yeah. The mainstream and independence are different, and that's good. Yeah. It, it opens up the possibility for, books that don't necessarily fit into one or the other to find a place in the one they fit into and i he didn't sound to me just just saying so you know, he didn't sound to me like you're bragging about going to the <laughs> record store i understand even in the more modern way you, you'd use the internet and look in places even on youtube still right there's these small channels yeah. that people don't really know about that maybe got only 100 views and you know back then that might have been a lot i don't know but Nowadays with the internet, it's like, okay, 100 views, basically nobody knows about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And it, it'd it be great if all these people could be discovered. And so having the places where maybe the less known can have their work be taken in and then shown to other people and shared. And then there's also places for things that fit into a more... I don't want to say standard, but the more mainstream, as you mentioned, mainstream form. And those are different forms, right? They're different genres in a way, even if it's the same, even if it's same fantasy fiction, it's still differences that make it fit better in one category or the other. Right. Right. And, and I, I applaud, I applaud anybody who can write a book that shows up in the drugstore. <laughs> I mean, I think really every writer secretly dreams of that. At least, at least every genre writer does. Right. Uh, and, you know, I grew up listening to the the song "Paperback Writer" by the Beatles. That was my that was my goal. I, I love these these old paperback books. I wanted to have a book in in uh, you know in the airport newspaper stand. But um, it's it, that's a that's a sensibility to yeah. to write that kind something that. Uh, that the the uh, you know the businessman who's taking a trip across the country he's just going to grab it and read he doesn't want his life complicated by a book <laughs> right and and to write that book is a, a is a tremendous skill um, so I I really I have to make that clear because I get accused every now and then of whining I'm not whining I these these are objective observations. Hmm. Uh you mentioned before that you have a wonderful uh, web designer on your team. Uh huh. Do you have multiple web designers, or is it just the? Is he working alone, or? It's, it's a it's one person. It's a and uh, it's a she, and I call her my secret weapon uh, because she makes she makes uh, she makes million dollar websites. There's no <laughs> no other way to say it. Like to. She uh, she has made us some incredible websites. I don't want anybody to steal her from me right now. That's why mm. I, I'm keeping her uh, top secret. But uh, uh, most people can probably figure out who it is. Um, 
but uh, again, she should be she should be working for Microsoft or something. It's 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 unbelievable. I just don't know how the you know, all this talent falls through the cracks. I don't get it. But I think it's wonderful and lucky that you managed to find her. And oh yes, yes it is. That's right. It's uh, I should look at the silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> and so, for Pulp Modern, you have uh, you do have a gorgeous website, and we are totally um, uh, amazed by it as an ever moth. It's beautiful. And bef- did you have her on the team initially, or did you discover her after the launch of Pulp Modern? And if you didn't find her until after, what part was most challenging when you didn't have that access to your secret weapon? <laughs> well, the part that was most challenging was that uh, my my website looked like absolute garbage. Uh, <laughs> I had a, before I had a, um, what's it called, a blog spot, a blogger, whatever they call it, um, you know, with just the guidelines, which I felt was enough at the time. Um, but uh, this person came to me and said, you know, you if you really want to sell your books, you're, you're going to have to work on your presentation. And she, she's absolutely right. And uh <laughs> That's uh, that's that's how that happened. I mean, this this is all this is all very recent stuff. That website is very new, and uh, you know it's exciting because it's uh, like I said, you know, you, you have to you have to you have to re up every now and then with what you're doing. Uh, make it. I guess it's like a marriage. You know, you have to you have to add a little spice every now and then. And uh, uh, this these websites have. They've reinvigorated me. They've they've uh, retuned my my interest in in putting out great products. So I think that's that's amazing that it's also invigorating you as well in this process. Yeah. Well, it's you know when someone else is excited about uh, you know it, again it's another member of the team and they and they they see the the end the the finish line or whatever. They, they see the horizon you're you're traveling toward and they get it that's what's really important uh, you know everybody that works on the team uh, like I said we're, we're, we're not clones but we do kind of have the same interests like my my web person uh, just like me she's just constantly overflowing with ideas mm-hmm. which is a little bit dangerous because you, you can you can get to a place where you don't get anything done because you're constantly working on a new idea but uh from that that kind of mutual character trait we can really we can communicate well and and accomplish things which is important and that helps to your ability to accomplish things and your ability to create new ideas helps you to keep pulp modern uh, very dynamic and very active and change in ways that allow people to see evolutions very clearly. And yeah. I think that's amazing. And it, I think also that you've worked hard from what we can see at Snowbird Mall. We worked hard uh, and you seem to be working hard to build a sense of community, not only on the publishing side of things, but also for authors. And I think you've gone into a, a bit already but could you dive a little bit deeper into why that community building is so important for you yeah well it's tricky um community that's a word that can it has a uh great meaning and it can also have a very dangerous meaning when when community becomes a kind of a hive mind then then you have problems because what what's going to happen is there's not going to be any progress right Things get stagnant when everybody is exactly on the same page. You need you need some people who are looking a few pages ahead and also taking some cues from a few pages back, you know, to figure out what you're going to do on the current page. And uh, hopefully, I I killed that metaphor completely. But um, <laughs> um, you know, community is is it's interesting writing. Writing fiction is a solitary activity. It's a solitary sport. Mm. You have to ultimately sit down and do the you, you, the writer. You have to sit down and spend many hours working on a manuscript. 
so the it's it's almost a bit of a, a contradiction that that there's a writing community. Uh, most mostly, what I see with the writing community, uh, at least on social media, for the most part, is a lot of encouragement. You yeah. have like uh, you know this very famous guy uh, Gabino Iglesias, who is always uh, posting inspirational things on Twitter to writers that you can do this, right? Yeah. Uh, no matter what's happening in your life, you can get up today and write. Uh, just go do it. And I think that's good. I think that's uh, that kind of encouragement is a good thing. Um, but like I said, you every now and then you get uh, gatekeepers um, who can uh, dis, uh, disrupt and uh, even halt uh, progress. Right. I don't know. I, I I think community works if you have the right people involved. Um, and I, I think that all those people have to be supportive of each other, regardless of whether or not they have personal differences. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you might have dis- like, disagree- disagreements about the exact details of of your philosophies, but being able to support each other and be like, hey. I think you can do what you're going to do, and I think that like, it'll be awesome what you put out. I may not agree with it, but put in that effort, put in that work anyway. Yeah, they're, they're really, uh, something I'd like to see more of is a kind of a live and let live. Because um, we have we, ha- we do have some people in, in the writing community who want to define exactly, for instance, what crime fiction is. Hmm. Well, that, that, the moment you define something, you've kind of ruined it. There's no there's no room to experiment to grow, um, and I've seen I've seen writers get attacked for what they write and and get told they can't write that. Uh, I I think that's that's not productive, hmm. you know. So I I would just say a community is good. Just make sure everybody's getting along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we definitely agree with that. Uh people do need to get along for a community to really work well together but we also want to avoid you know making sure everybody fits into a specific mold and that's the the hive mind you're talking about that kind of falling into the group think trap in a way um, right and so with that and talking about you know talking about gatekeeping and trying to avoid that and talking about your philosophies regarding uh writing and fiction and wanting a place for people to have a home for their work with Pulp Modern. Is there one thing within all these great things that you've talked about that if you could choose that Pulp Modern to be known for, is the one thing that you could pick? Well, uh, yeah, I would, I would, I hope that people will always remember that, that Pulp Modern uh, bulldozed right through all the, the lulls, the moments where the indie scene was going to die, uh, Pulp Modern chugged along and made sure that, that there was a place to send stories until a new crop of magazines came up. Mm. Uh, that's because I'm, you know, I'm not making any money with Pulp Modern. And, uh, so the, 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 the reward has to be that, um, you know, that we were there for, for writers. Mm. I think that's a very beautiful message to, and beautiful desire for Pulp Modern to have it be a place where people can find a home, even when everything else seems to be kind of falling apart in the scene. When there's not really any other place we can go, we can always rely on this kind of pillar in the community to keep things and to provide a place for people to go to. And so, and and and, pro- and provide a place where if. If you write a story and you you think, oh, I'm a little bit embarrassed about this, um, I don't think anybody will publish it. Uh, you know, I don't I don't publish smut or anything. But if if there's some value to it, if you think like you didn't sit down and write it, you know, there there must have been a reason you wrote it, mm. and uh, rather than be ashamed of it, send it to Pulp Modern and. Uh, you know, at worst, we'll be ashamed right along with you. (laughs) (laughs) 
And so on that note, thank you, Alec, for talking with me today and being on the Writer's Triangle. And no, no problem. I love it. It was wonderful having you. And thank you to all of our beautiful moths for listening today. And so, Alec, can you tell the people where to find you and everything Pulp Modern? Well, you can go to pulpmodern.net. And that is the main Pulp Modern site. Of course, we have a flash fiction site that's uh, pulpmodernflash.com. That's, that's a, uh, well, I don't want to go to that. Um, uh, unclebpublications.com. And uh, I, I would say look for us on Twitter, but I'll be honest with you. I am trying to figure out a way to uh leave twitter to to uh do what i do without having to use twitter i i find it very toxic so okay and so <laughs> so be yeah sure so i just to... i don't want i don't want to lead anybody to the twitter sites and then suddenly it's gone you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's understandable but for all of you listening be sure to check out pulp modern's beautiful website and be sure to visit cinnabarmoth.com to check out the transcripts, and we'll also have all of the links that Alec just mentioned available for you to find there. Uh, Alec, once again, thank you for coming on and talking with me today. It's been wonderful having you. Well, thanks for having me. And I hope you have a good night. Goodbye. All right, thank you.